Hi everyone and welcome to the next episode in the history of medicine. Now this particular video and the one after it ladies and gentlemen we're going to be looking at these two men. There you go Simpson and Lister. James Simpson and Joseph Lister. It sounds like a firm of solicitors or something like that but actually they were two very important people in the history of medicine. Now, surgery in the 1800s. Hmm, big problems. Blood loss, infection and pain. Three big problems which meant that surgery was not at all very popular. People tr treated and went for surgery and operations as a last resort because so many people died during the operation. It was not popular. Now, because people didn't want the operations, when they went for serious operations like an amputation to have an arm or a leg chopped off, the surgeons had to work very, very quickly because, of course, the patient was awake. The patient was conscious. So it was all about speed. And there was a very famous surgeon, a man called Robert Liston, not Lister, Liston, and he could operate very, very quickly. He would amputate a leg in about 30 seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Now, because he was operating so quickly, sometimes mistakes occurred. One famous operation, unfortunately, he sliced the fingers of one of his assistants, who's actually holding the patient down. In another operation, he was removing a leg, amputating a leg very high up at the thigh and he slipped and it was a male and he removed part of the body that maybe the man would not be very pleased about. You could say that the patients would become grumpy or grouchy. Well, surgery in those days certainly put the ouch in grouchy. Sorry about that. Now, how did this change. What did Simpson do and what did Lister do? Now if you look on here you see in Simpson the P. P for pain. He helped to solve the problem of pain. If you look in Lister you see the ER. Well there's ER in germs. So Lister did a lot of work for germs and infection Simpson P did a lot of work in pain. Hopefully that will remind you which way round it goes, ladies and gentlemen. Now let's start the story. Go back 1799. That's the start of the story. A man called Humphrey Davy. Mr. Davy, he's a chemist. And what does he do? He begins to discover and use nitrous oxide. Now, nitrous oxide has another name. It's called laughing gas. And sometimes at that time in fairgrounds, people would take laughing gas ho, 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 and then they would get punched as part of a fairground attraction. And they would not feel the pain. Somehow the nitrous oxide has numbed the pain. That was the start. Let's go forward 40 years. 1842, an American, a man called Crawford Long. Now, he starts to use a chemical called ether. Now, it did have some success, but unfortunately, Long did not write his results down. He didn't do an official report, so therefore people ignored his work. It was a start, but you could say there was a long way to go. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Now, the real beginning, the real start of the solution. 1845, a man called Horace Wells. Now, he was an American dentist. And what he does is he uses the laughing gas, the nitrous oxide, and it begins to work. So he's using it on patients and then he's removing the teeth and they are not feeling the pain. We have here a successful anaesthetic. So what does Mr. Wells do? He says, well, he says, sorry. He says, look, 
I think I'm onto something here. I'm going to invite an audience of experts and then I'm going to show that nitrous oxide works. And that's what he did, 1845. Bad luck though. Unfortunately, nitrous oxide does not work on everybody. And the person that he chose that day, he gave him the nitrous oxide, the laughing gas, but it didn't affect him. So when he tried to remove the tooth, of course, the patient screams out in pain. But what would the audience do? Oh, nitrous oxide doesn't work. And very famously, one of them shouted humbug, which was sort of an old fashioned word for rubbish. This is rubbish. This is humbug. Doesn't work. OK, I suppose another member of the audience could have shouted out, Wells, you're not telling us the whole tooth. <laughs> Sorry about that. Terrible jokes. Now. 1845, Wells. Let's move forward a year. 1846, a man called William Morton. Now, this time, he's using ether. And he's using it on a patient who had a growth on their neck. Now, he used the ether and he's able to remove the growth from the neck. Ether seems to be working. You could say, I suppose, really, that, you know, ether was helping to get over a pain in the neck. <laughs> Look, stop telling jokes. I apologize. Now, 1846, ether seems to be working. We have a change here. But there was a problem with ether. In fact, there were several. It's very strong smelling. It could irritate the eyes. It could irritate the lungs. It could cause people to cough. OK, and unfortunately, in certain areas, it could explode. It is flammable. Now, remember, rich people did not like to go to hospital at this time, so they would have the operation at home. Well, imagine having ether in their home and it exploding. It would make it unpopular. So there was still a need to find something better than ether. I suppose you could say ether didn't work either. <laughs> Sorry. Now then, the key year, 1847. That's the key year. And the key man, Mr. Simpson, with a P, P for pain. Now, he was a very successful man, a professor, a uh, professor of midwifery. In other words, he was very heavily involved with looking after pregnant women. Now, of course, he'd seen that pregnancy and childbirth was painful. What could he do to help the women? Well, he gets a few mates round and they have a tea. They have a nice dinner. And then afterwards, they get out some chemicals. And they literally try various chemicals. Chemical number one. Ooh, ooh, nothing. Chemical number two. Nothing. Chemical number three. Boom. They're all on the floor. Simpson comes round. Whoa, what was that? Ooh. What was this chemical that has knocked out Simpson and his friends? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, was a chemical called chloroform. Here we have the first successful anaesthetic. And so Simpson, taking this experiment, he goes into the lab and he does more experiments. And he begins to realize that chloroform can be used to overcome pain. Now then, this is a big step forward. The effect of chloroform. Now, great news, you would say. Surgery must be better. People are going to be asleep. Therefore, they won't feel the pain. Great news. But there was opposition. Can you believe it? Opposition to something as successful as that. Why, ladies and gentlemen, why would people oppose chloroform? Have you got any ideas? Well, here's a couple for you to think about. Number one, it was still a very religious time. In the Bible, there is a quote which says that God has said that women should feel pain during childbirth. 
So some people said, oh, you are going against God. Man cannot go against God. Therefore, we will not use chloroform. Reason number one. Secondly, it was a new idea. People didn't trust or believe new ideas. Thirdly, some army doctors said, oh, it's going to make the soldiers soft. We don't want that. Let them man up and have an operation. Now, crazy now for us to think that. But looking back at the time, that was the attitude. Here's another one. When you are in hospital now, if you go to hospital and have an anaesthetic, it's very carefully worked out how much they give you. It's a profession now, people called anaesthetists, and it's very well regulated. Back then in the early days, people didn't know. And unfortunately, there were problems. One girl, 15 year old, a girl called Hannah Greener, went into the hospital because she had an infected toenail. That was a minor operation. But unfortunately, she became the first person to die because she was given too much chloroform. So when people start to die, then they'll say, whoa, we're not having chloroform. So there was opposition. Eventually, the opposition was overcome and people got over it. Two factors here. 1848, a man called Dr. John Snow invented an inhaler so that you could have the correct amount. Dr. Snow, have we heard of him before, I wonder? Anyone remember? Cholera, Broad Street, the pump in the street, yes, well remembered. So Dr. John Snow begins to sort out the problem of chloroform. And in 1853, Queen Victoria, during the birth of her eighth child, she was given chloroform. And of course, many doctors said, well, well, if it's OK for the Queen, we will use it. So chloroform gradually begins to be accepted as we moved into the 1850s. So you could say, great news, pain has been solved. Big tick, surgery must improve. Hooray. But no, sadly not, ladies and gentlemen. As we moved on from 1847, 1850s, 1860s, the death rate in surgery actually increased. Why would that be? People are not dying from pain and the shock anymore. So why are more people dying? Have you got any ideas? Have a think. Why? Why are more people dying? Well, here's a few answers. The surgeons say, look, the patient's asleep. I can now attempt more difficult, internal, complex, longer surgery because I can go deep inside the body because the patient's asleep. OK, you might say, but, and it's a big but, they still hadn't sorted out germs and infection. Remember, before 1861, Louis Pasteur germ theory. So yes, the surgeons are going deeper inside, but their hands are filthy. The knives are filthy. The instruments are in a bag on the floor. Therefore, more germs, more infection was going into the patients. So they will die from the infection. And that's why the death rate increased. Here's something strange now. Imagine you are a patient. 1850s, so you're going to be given chloroform, you'll be asleep. Two surgeons come in, one wearing a completely clean frock, a surgical froth. The second one, totally covered in blood and pus. Which one would you choose? Of course, the clean. Back then, no, no, no. They'd say, oh, look at him. He's very experienced. He's done loads of operations. He's completely covered because they didn't know about the germs. So they would choose that person. And then, of course, infections would follow. More deaths. So the period after the discovery of chloroform, actually, the death rate went up. And it was known as the black period of surgery. Black for mourning, as there is more and more deaths. So, how important is Simpson? Yes, he solves pain. But did he improve surgery completely? Now, 
When he died in 1870, 30,000 people went to his funeral, stood on the streets. So he was obviously an important person. But his real impact could only be felt when infection was solved. And of course, for infection to be solved, we had to wait for 1861 and Louis Pasteur. So ladies and gentlemen, the next video, we'll have a look at that. All the best now. See you soon.